We're going to be reading God's Word this morning from the book of Acts. Two particular episodes in the life of the church. So our first passage comes from Acts chapter 16. This is found on page 1096 in the Bibles in the Pews. If you'd like to follow along there. From Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to leave at once for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Then let's also turn to Acts chapter 26. This is a few pages later in the Bibles in the pews on um, page 1107. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light blazing, oh, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. Maybe one of the biggest questions 
we wrestle with as Christians is the question of what God wants us to do. Where does God want us to be? What does God want us to do with our lives? We ask this question in big ways and small ways. And we hope that we will get the clarity of the answers that we need. As we think about the book of Acts this morning, this whole question of where is God leading is one of the perennial questions in the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts is a book of uncharted territory. It's the history of the beginning of the church. And none of them have been here before. They don't know what the path looks like. And so consistently through the book of Acts, there are moments where leaders in the church need to stop and figure out which direction are we going. It begins almost at the very beginning of the book. There are 11 disciples, not 12, because Judas has committed suicide. But they're sure that there needs to be 12 apostles. And so they ask, well, how do we figure out who is supposed to be one of us? And they talk things through. And they say, it should be someone who was with us from the beginning. And they suggest two men who were with them from the beginning, although we're not part of the twelve. And they cast lots between them. But all through the book, there is this question of how do we know where God is leading and how do we find the will of God? And there's a wide variety of ways in which they get the answer, whether it is the casting lots in chapter 1, whether it's having a conference in Acts 15, whether it's a vision which happens multiple times throughout the book whether it's Peter having a vision of clean and unclean animals before he is supposed to go and proclaim the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile, whether it's Paul's vision in Acts 16 that we just read. And so this morning I want us to think about the ways in which God leads, two of the ways in which God leads in the book of Acts. And I don't think that at the end of the sermon we're going to have a simple three-step program for determining the will of God. It'd be kind of nice if we had that, but perhaps things are going to be muddier rather than clearer. I hope not. What I want to suggest as we look at these two episodes is that the way God leads can be difficult to discern. And if we are going to find the will of God, we need to be humble and patient and attentive. These two episodes are different kinds of stories, different kinds of problems. In Acts chapter 26, we're going to hear Paul talk about his own story and what is at its heart a theological problem for Paul. He has been very zealous for the truth as he knew it, the scriptures that he grew up with. And yet there's been something missing in the way that he reads it. And he needs a Damascus Road experience to open his eyes so that he can see where God is leading. In Acts chapter 16, the problem is rather different. Where does Paul go next is the question. It's a practical day-to-day -day question. Not are you following Jesus or not, but where do you go when God calls you to follow? Both kinds of questions are questions that we can face. The big picture questions of what does God want me to do, and then the day-to-day, -day, where do I need to be now? What place am I supposed to be in? So I'm going to start in reverse order. We're going to start with 
Acts 26, and Paul narrating for the third time in this book the story of his conversion. And it differs a little bit in wording from earlier in Acts where you know, Paul has heard Jesus say, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul remembers that here as well. But there's a second part of what Jesus says to Paul that we didn't hear before. It is painful for you to kick against the goads. It might not be a familiar image for us. We don't really herd oxen all that often. But this is what is being said. It is painful for you to pull for you to kick against the goads. An ox goad is a long stick. And you use it to gently, hopefully, or a little more forcefully if necessary, necessarily whack the side of your ox to keep it going in the right direction. And so you do this when you are farming if you want your ox to plow a nice straight road, and your ox is not inclined to do that. You goad it along. And a bad-tempered ox will kick back because it's not all that pleasant to get whacked on your leg or your side to keep you going in the right direction. Paul had been kicking against the goads. And Paul says that when he encountered Jesus on that Damascus Road experience, one of the things that God said to him is, why are you kicking against the goads? So what had been goading Paul? What had been trying to nudge him in the right direction and Paul wasn't listening? Sometimes commentators have said, well, this was conscience. Paul knew deep down that he should know better than what he was doing. Paul should have known that throwing Christians in jail or approving of their execution, that that's, you know, wrong. And Paul's conscience should have been pricking him, should have been pushing him. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on Acts, says that he's not convinced that the goads are your conscience. Not that we should ignore our consciences. Your conscience, well-tuned, is a very useful thing to have. But F.F. F. Bruce says, no, Paul, when he talks about his conscience, and he does a couple chapters earlier in Acts 24, he says his conscience has been clear his whole life. He's always been convinced that what he was doing was right. So what were the goads that he was missing? And I think that the way Luke tells the story of Paul here in Acts, the goads were Scripture. You can hear that in chapter 26, that Paul says this is what he's been doing, that he has been explaining that the story of Jesus is what the prophets and Moses said would happen. And you get that language several times in Luke and in Acts as well, that the story of Jesus is the story told by Scripture. In Luke 24, as Jesus is talking to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, he says, well, this was what was supposed to happen according to the law and the prophets and the Psalms. The whole book, the whole scripture is a Jesus book. And that, I think, was what Paul was supposed to see. That's what he was supposed to recognize. That when he read the scripture, when he heard the voice of God in the word of God, he was supposed to see Jesus. But he didn't. It wasn't until the Damascus Road, it wasn't until his eyes were opened that he could. Until then, Paul is kicking against the goats. Until then, Paul is flying blind. He needs the Spirit to open his eyes. He needs to hear Scripture again for the first time. Now, I think that raises a question for us. Because we sometimes are like Paul. We have, many of us have grown up with this Scripture from the beginning. 
And we have read it, and we have read it, and we have read it well. But we also read it with our own ears, with our own weaknesses. And so sometimes we run the risk of kicking against the goads. Because as we read scripture, we read what we want to hear from it. And we look for it to confirm the way that we've always done things, or the way that we are. Do we need to be goaded, redirected? What lessons of Jesus have we imperfectly learned so that we are still comfortable in our old ways of thinking or in our own self-righteousness? For us to overcome our theological blinders, we're going to need to listen to God, to each other. We're going to need to seek the will of God and not assume that we have already heard it. But now let's shift gears and think about that other kind of decision-making back in chapter 16, which in some ways is less problematic for us because it's not about needing to turn 180 degrees because everything you're doing is wrong, which is where Paul was on that Damascus road. But in some ways, Acts 16 is more troubling because here's Paul the super apostle. Here's Paul the missionary. Here's Paul the 100% on fire for Jesus guy. And he doesn't know which direction to go. And so we can run into this problem as well where even as we try to follow Jesus Christ, it's not clear what the next step is. And so the story is told in chapter 16. This is Paul's second missionary journey. And Paul has split with Barnabas, his companion on the first journey, and he's gone in a different direction, and we don't have any sense that Paul's not where he's supposed to be. But he's been retracing steps of their first missionary journey. He's gone places where they've been before to strengthen and encourage people. And then they need to know what's next. And the places on the map don't necessarily speak to us. We don't really know, you know, off the top of our head where Phrygia or Mysia is. That's okay. The point is that Paul and his companions are trying to proclaim the gospel. They're trying to be in the place God wants them to be. And it takes three times for them to figure out where that place actually is. They have been forbidden by the Holy Spirit from working in Phrygia and Galatia, which is kind of the central third of modern-day Turkey, if you're dividing it from north to south in thirds. And... We know that there are churches in those places. At least there end up being churches in those places. It's a place where the gospel can and should go. But the Holy Spirit says that's not where Paul is supposed to go at this point in time. So if you're not supposed to be in one place, then you're supposed to be somewhere else. And Paul says, well, maybe it's Bithynia, which is in that northern third, dividing the place in thirds, And it's on the coast of the Black Sea, good vacation territory. It's not a bad place to be. And F.F. F. Bruce says in his commentary, if the province of Asia was not to be the field of their immediate evangelistic activity, then it was natural for them to cast their eyes farther north. And think of the highly civilized province of Bithynia in northwest Asia Minor with its Greek cities, of which Nicomedia and Nicaea were the most important, and Jewish settlements. 
In short, it seems like a natural place to go. Because it's not barbaric. There are Jewish settlements there, and Paul, the missionary, often goes to places where there's a Jewish population first. It fits with the method that he has learned, the method that he's been kind of refining as they go along. So it's a logical place to go, except the answer is also no. And now they're kind of running out of real estate. And so they find themselves in Troas, which is now on the western coast of Asia Minor. And they don't know where they're going. And it's, it's at this point that Paul has a vision. And the answer is none of the places where they've been, but is across the Aegean Sea in Macedonia. Now, why is Macedonia the place that gets a yes? There are people who needed the gospel in Phrygia and Galatia and Pontus and Bithynia and Mysia. And it isn't entirely clear from the text why this is yes when the others were no. Is it the territory? Luke has said at the beginning of Acts that we need to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we're crossing a barrier here. We cross from Asia, Asia Minor, into Europe. Is it geography that is the reason? That's the barrier that needs to be crossed. Is it that there are specific people that need to be met? In Troas, the narration changes from they to we. And traditionally, when people have read the book of Acts, they have wondered if that switch from they to we means that the author of the book joined Paul's team at this point. Traditionally, Luke is thought of as the author. Is it that Paul needed to meet Luke at this point? Or is it the people that he's going to meet when he crosses over to Philippi and Lydia is the first person that he meets? Or the Philippian jailer who gets met next? Or is it Priscilla and Aquila or Apollos, people that he will meet later in this trip? People who are important in the spread of the gospel. I always grew up with the geographical explanation that it was that the gospel needed to jump into Europe at this point in time. The more I think about it, though, the more I like the idea that it's the people that Paul is supposed to meet as he crosses. Because the gospel spreads through people when the Holy Spirit works through them. So Paul, our super missionary apostle, is also the kind of person who can have the door closed on him two times before the right door opens. Paul is a person who can hear no from God before he hears yes. And Paul leads us then to consider, well, what doors does God open and close? And when does God open them and why? What doors are opening for us? What people are we supposed to meet? And here I must confess that the question becomes very personal. Because for the last year and a half, I've been trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life when I grow up. I've been looking for teaching positions. And if in late January we were having this conversation, I would have said, I don't know, but I see three possible doors that seem to be open in front of me, three good options. There was a position with the Christian Reformed Church in North America that was being advertised that I thought I was a pretty good fit for. Dort College, now university, still seems pretentious. My alma mater, 
was looking for a theology professor. Ooh, ooh. And Calvin Seminary was going to be needing an Old Testament person for just the year. But, you know, I, it's another alma mater. I do Old Testament stuff. And so although it's a weird job market right now in, you know, theological higher education, I thought, there are doors. And any of these doors look like a good option. And I could see them being, you know, the place where I'm supposed to settle in and spend a good long time. And of course, then that provides clarity and security for the rest of my family, all of which seem really good to me. All of those doors shut. And so what am I supposed to make of that? And in the meantime, a different door opened. And some of you know this, it's not, you know, some of you don't. But I've recently accepted a one-year teaching position at Central College in Pella, Iowa. And because it's a one-year teaching position, and that doesn't seem like the long-term door that opens, the rest of the family's staying here for the year, and I'm going to be living in my mom's basement. Cue all of the jokes about 40-year-olds living in their mom's basement. Is this where God is leading? It feels like it. But it doesn't feel like a slam dunk either. Wouldn't it? It'd be kind of nice if it was clearer, fuller. But at the same time, this does feel at least close enough to where God is leading. And so I find myself wondering, well, as I go through this door, who am I supposed to meet? Why this place for this year? And I don't know the answer yet. So, perhaps that's all I can say about what Acts is teaching us in terms of learning the will of God. Perhaps I've only made things murkier as we look at these passages. I think that they suggest to us that there are multiple points in time where God speaks and God directs. And that there's also a lot that we don't necessarily know about discerning God's will. The journey is not always straight and the direction is not always clear. Paul the Pharisee is convinced that he's right. But in Acts 26, he says he was kicking against the goads. Paul the Apostle can run into dead ends until it's the third time that's the charm. So how does that help us in our life of faith? Well, partially it helps by giving us comfort. Because our paths are murky at times, and doors do close when we thought they should stay open. And we need to know that. A closed door is not actually proof that the system isn't working. Although it may take time, and it may take a changed vantage point to see how the system is working. So if that's all Paul's experience, particularly in Act 16, did, if the comfort that it offers to us in our confusion, if that was all that the passage did, that, that's still something. It's still significant. But it does a little more than that, more than just providing comfort. Paul's experience calls us to be humble and teachable, to not be so stubborn that we end up kicking against the goads, to be willing to take no for an answer, and then when the door opens, to be willing to follow where God leads. 
Amen.